Jesus said, A little while, and you all will not see me. And another little while, and you all will see me. Then some of his disciples said to one another, What does this mean? That he is saying to us, A little while, and you all will no longer see me, and again a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Creator, they said, what does he mean by this, a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Are you all discussing among yourselves what I meant when I said, A little while, and you all will no longer see me, and again a little while, and you all will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will all weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will all have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has pain because her time has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the tribulation because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. So you all have pain now, but I will see you all again and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. The Gospel of the Lord. The author Stephen King turned 75 this past week, and in celebration of that, the magazine Esquire listed what they considered to be his 75 best books beginning with their 75th pick and ending with number one. I know you all want to know what number one is. Any guesses? The stand is two. <laughs> oh, Shining's like 11. You've probably never heard of it. It's too scary for you. What is it? It. It, the clown one, right? What I found interesting about this was that the Shawshank Redemption, a novella that he wrote that um, inspired the movie, the novella was called Rita Haywood and the Shawshank Redemption. <clears throat> that wasn't even on the list. I took personal offense at this. Many of you have seen the Shawshank Redemption <clears throat> Excuse me, and we'll recognize the quote. <clears throat> we'll recognize the quote. Hope is a good thing, maybe the best thing, and good things never die, right? From Andy Dufresne. Uh, the reason at, uh, at the conference I was at this week, one of our speakers began by saying, Hope seems to be in short supply these days. We North Americans are not good at hoping because we have the privilege of being optimists. It is only through suffering that authentic hope can rise up. So anyone who has seen or read The Shawshank Redemption knows it is a story about Someone who is in prison for something they did not do and they're there for 25, 30 years. It is about all the ways they cope in the prison and the friends that they make. Uh, <clears throat> in the end, we see authentic hope rise up in one of the main characters in one of the more dramatic scenes where he is standing in the rain. And you might have seen that picture on posters. The reason it affects our feelings the way it does, that part of the Shawshank Redemption, is because we have seen for two plus hours everything he went through to get to that moment. Authentic hope only rises up through suffering. Now, when we decided to use Will de Gaffney's lectionary for this first year, <clears throat> there were things about it that we did not fully realize. I was excited 
to look at a lectionary that centered women and children. <clears throat> Excuse me, could somebody please give me a cup? Um, <clears throat> I don't know why it always happens when I preach. Um, I was excited to read some texts that we normally don't include in our lectionary. <clears throat> and, and so we kind of entered into it, we being the worship planning committee, just a little bit recklessly. We looked it over, but we had no idea all the lessons that we would be reading in church, including all the les lessons about sexual assault and keening and deep grief and sorrow, all the things that have been carefully edited in the Revised Common Lectionary, because we can only take so much of that pain stuff, you know. We need to get on with it. Isn't a, um, reading about, thank you, David's assault of Bathsheba once every three years sufficient? Do we have to read about this kind of um, a, assault against women more than once, sometimes several weeks in a row? Both Steve and I, who I thought we were relatively woke, both of us said, how long is this going to go on? How much more of this do we have to read? That was a core um, discovery at this con conference that I was at. Um, Wilda Gaffney's mission was to write a, a lectionary that centered the stories of women and children that are not included in our revised common lectionary. But that meant that many of the stories we heard about women and children were going to be very difficult to hear. They were about things that we really don't talk about very much. We get our therapy um, on the issue of sexual assault by watching Law and Order SVU. We don't actually talk about that with one another. We might say in passing, yes, something happened to me at some point in life, and somebody else will say, yes, me too. But we never sit down and say, this is what happened to me. Part of that is because we live in a culture of wishful thinking and cultural optimism, and that is not the same thing as authentic hope. We are less inclined, we here in North America, to have a wall of wailing that we can take this kind of depth of despair to in prayer to God. We are less inclined to have that even after all the pain and suffering and loss that we have experienced in North America we are less inclined to have a wall of wailing and more likely to say, God is great, God is good, but thanks God we got this, right? We are not the kind of people who cry out, God save us. But black people do, Hispanics do, people in minorities, trans people do, right? People who know what it is to live lives of suffering. People who know that when they see George Floyd killed, that the next day it could be their own son or grandson, they know about crying out, God, save us. We know, turn the page and then the news cycle will change. I mean, we'll go to the march, right? We'll do that. But then we sort of feel like we've checked the box. We've read the anti-racism books. We even did a study on a couple of them, right? So we know about it. But we have not been brave enough to enter in to the pain and suffering of one another and of minorities. And maybe that's why our churches are emptying, is because those who are carrying this kind of grief don't feel like there's a place for them here, the place where more than any place else, they should feel free to cry and keen about their grief. Imani Dodley, or Imani O'Lear, she has gotten married, 
and I have been friends for 25 years. <clears throat> we met when we went to seminary. And she was the keynote speaker at the event that I just attended. And Amani said that <clears throat> she is now the assistant to the bishop. Before that, she led three different congregations in upstate New York. Without expecting this to happen, she ended up walking with all three congregations to closing their churches, all three of them. Um, and she contends that those churches closed because the congregation insisted in all three, we are a family. They couldn't set down the concept that they were a family so that they could become a community of belonging. Now, what does that mean? Perhaps we've said it here. Perhaps you think it now. What it means is if you think about your family, and I know that, that some of you come from wonderful families, marvelous families, families that I sometimes covet when I hear your stories, right? But many, many people, if they look at the individuals in their families, they've got mental illness, and they've got depression, and one has been unemployed for five years and has given up on even looking for a job, which makes everyone else very irritated by them. Some of our family members drink too much, some of them take too many drugs, some of them always have a condescending voice when they talk to us as if they know better than we do about everything, right? These are the characters that occupy our families. And Imani's point was, we are born into these families. We love them. We find ways to work around or tolerate or quietly move away from the people of our families who make us uncomfortable. But what we didn't get before we were born or adopted into that family was we didn't give consent. I didn't choose to be born in this family. Someone else didn't choose to be adopted into a family, and yet here we are. And what that means is all of the dysfunction in the family, it just is. But we love them because we grew up with it. It wasn't like one day they were angry and the next day they were happy, or maybe it is like that every other day. It was that we were slowly conditioned as we grew that this is what it means to be part of a family and we roll with it. And sometimes we do better than roll with it. Sometimes we actually listen and look at one another for a good minute and look at what we have been missing. Imani contends that if that is true uh, and we persist on calling communities of faith families, none of you consented to be here either. And that the dynamics that play out in families will play out here. And that means that we do things like, we'll listen to one another for a little bit about a trouble they're having, and then we'll be tired of it, or we'll have to get somewhere, or we have no idea what to say next. So we deftly will change the subject. I am so sorry you're feeling that way. Hey, can you help me move this stuff? Right? And we get really good at doing that. So we never do the deep look, and we stop really seeing one another. When that happens, people feel like they don't belong. They don't belong here. And if you've ever felt like you did not belong even in your own family, you know how painful that can be. As we move forward, there are a lot of people who are missing, right? There's people who are missing, but we don't really talk about the fact that they're missing because that makes us too uncomfortable. We don't talk about the fact that they're missing sometimes because, you know, one of them left because Pastor Marie was mean to them and somebody else left because they got left out at communion and we never apologize for that. And someone else left because people looked at them strange when their child wouldn't stop running around. 
And I'm not talking about right now. I'm talking about the history of churches, right? These things happen in churches, but we don't face them because if we are like a family, we don't want to intervene with that. That's just how they are. We're just going to let it go and work around them. That does not build authentic community. What Amani is suggesting is that we set aside the um, metaphor that a church is a family and we start thinking in terms of we are creating communities of belonging. And if everyone here is part of that belonging, then we have to do a better job at changing our response to tragedy and changing our response to these difficult things that crop up in people so that we don't work around them. We don't cut their conversation short because it makes us uncomfortable. We learn to sit and look at one another really look and begin to understand who we are. To this end, Imani began this whole presentation about creating communities of belonging by saying, um, we have forgotten about each other. And the way that she knows that is because we talk about each other. We all do, don't we? We talk about each other, but not necessarily to each other. People leave and we don't really talk about that, even though everyone carries sorrow in their heart because whether they were right to leave or wrong to leave, it hurts to not have them in that chair. Right? We accept pat answers for why people choose to go somewhere else, whether that answer is accurate or not. Perhaps they can't even name the answer, but it has something to do with they cease to have a, a feeling of belonging. And so uh, one of the things that we learned was what to identify what is essential in a community of belonging and then as we look at and talk to one another to ask what is missing. Here's, the, um, here's a story that Imani told that helped us to picture this. Imani created, um, let's see, yoga for a good hood, yoga number four, a good hood, dot org. It is an organization in um, upper New York in which people of color gather to be trained as yoga instructors, and they have yoga classes for people of color. She said, yoga has been taken over, these are her words, not mine, has been token, taken over by skinny, blonde, white chicks. <laughs> and it was hard to argue the point, right? And that um, you, the, African American people in this community were built a little bit differently than the typical yoga person. They didn't have the money to go through expensive training to become a yogi. They sometimes didn't have the money to attend the class. So she started this organization, and if you go to Buffalo, you could see a big mural of her on a wall like this in which um, their goal is to create a community of belonging for people who needed yoga, which we all need those kind of stretches in our lives, who needed that but couldn't afford it and couldn't afford to be trained. This was several years ago. So far, nearly 20 people have been trained. They have a regular um, three or four classes a day. People come from all over. Some cannot pay and the foundation that they set up takes care of that and for caring for the instructors. So that is an example of a community of belonging. And the reason I tell you about it is it all came back to two questions. And those questions, again, are what is essential and what is missing? So when somebody was getting ready, say, um, to do a uh, warrior pose. 
the teacher would then look at their legs, look at their arms, and see if they were doing it correctly. But before they went over and put hands on them to adjust them, or before they went over and told them, you need to bend that knee more, they looked at their face and they tried to discern what else is happening here. Are they embarrassed because they're kind of heavy and others aren't so much? Do they have something uh, going on with that back knee that they are in pain? Uh, do they not understand the direction? And Amani said those two questions can guide us into building communities of belonging. If we start to ask in any given moment, what is essential and what is missing? For example, I have been known to sometimes have an idea on the fly. <laughs> and I think, I know, I have this magical thinking that I think if only I think about this idea enough, you'll all see it too. And so then I go to enact the idea, say it's something like, let's make a circle for communion today, right? But I don't give adequate instruction because surely you can all see it too, it's right here. What is essential in that moment? To me, what was essential is, how do I get people to reconnect? I know, let's just look at each other while we have communion. What was missing? The direction for how we do it, you see? And so Imani it contends, and I am really uh, convinced that she's on to something, that we need to start asking what is essential, what is missing, and we need to start looking at each other, really looking. And this is a bit of a relief, you understand, because part of the reason that we cut short difficult conversations, that we don't want to hear the hard stories, we don't know what to say. But we do know that we need to say something because, boy, are we uncomfortable with the silence. The truth is we don't need to say something. The truth is that sitting in silence and just looking at one another or sitting and just listening and not trying to fix it will be healing enough. It allows space for God's own spirit to enter in and do the heavy lifting. What we are called to do is to begin to notice what is missing and do what we can to provide that. And so, in the end, it's not about what do we need to do, which is a common question of people in North America, especially white people. What do we need to do, but who, to, who do we need to become to become a safe space for including people and giving them a sense of belonging. A sense of belonging is brought about by mutual exchange of care, compassion, and courage. That is what binds us together. And so what do we need to do to make that happen? Part of the training was that Amani listed 16 behaviors 16 behaviors in congregations and frankly in North America that are part of our culture. And these behaviors collectively hold up white supremacy in systems. If we want to get past, we did a, a study on a book about anti-racism. If we want to get past that and say, how do we dismantle racism that is part of our structures? We need to look at these 16 behaviors that every single one of us do, at least a couple, some do many, and when we see ourselves doing them, we are the ones that need to change. We are the ones that need to change. It will be hard, it will take practice, it is not optional if we are serious of becoming communities of belonging. Um, one of the behaviors, just to give you a short example, one of the behaviors is we, th is we think more is more, and more than that is even better. And so for years in the church, we've been saying, how do we get more people? We need more services. How do we get more people? We need more food after church. How do we get more people? We need more studies. 
How do we get more people? We need to add and add and add and add and add to the list of everything we're doing until people, including the pastor, are so burned out, it comes out in their bodies and they get sick or leave. More is not necessarily more. What we need, maybe, is to do less, but to do what we are doing with intention and compassion. Maybe that's why. In today's gospel message uh, from John, we hear Jesus say, you will not see me, and then you will see me more than once. And the disciples are really confused. The four of us who together gave the children's sermon today saw one another, possibly for the first time at that level. I, if I had been very distraught in the moment, one of them probably would have noticed because the only thing that moment was about is really seeing one another. Those are the kinds of things we'll be practicing in the weeks to come because I know you. And I know that you are beloved people of God. I know that you are as confused as the greater church has been for decades about why these churches are not continuing to be full. I know that sometimes we've taken the easy way out and said, well, if they wouldn't have sports on Sunday, and if those parents would be a little bit more uh, interested in upholding their baptismal promises, I know how we have been defensive, and that's another one of the characteristics that upholds white supremacy in an institution. I also know you are here because you want this community to recover. You want this community to grow and, and become what we were called to be. You want other people to find the grace that you found here. Perhaps we've simply forgotten how to give it. By the grace of God, through Jesus Christ, we still receive it. And so learning again how to give it in compassionate care for one another is just a matter of trying.